Good afternoon and hope you are enjoying the 2021 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. My name is Arthur Choi and I'm a first year MBA student at MIT Sloan and it's my pleasure to introduce our next panel, Leading Through Change and Transition, presented by Wasserman. Our panelists today are Lindsay kagawa Colis, Executive VP, Talent plus the Collective at Wasserman, Amy Howe, President, FanDuel, Rob King, Senior VP and Editor-at-Large, ESPN, and Jason Wright, President, Washington Football Team. Our panel will be moderated by Shiro Springer, lecturer at Boston University and journalist at Sports Business Journal. The panel will run for 35 minutes and we will leave 10 minutes at the end for questions. Please use the, use the chat on the right side of the window for discussions during the panel and ask questions in the Q&A tab, as well as on Twitter using the hashtag leading through change. Questions will then be selected by the moderator. And with that, I'll turn it over to Shiro. Thank you, Arthur. And thank you, Amy, Jason, Rob, and Lindsay for being here today. As Arthur said, the topic of the panel is leading through change. So I'd like to start by asking you, what was the most challenging decision you made over the past year? And we'll start with you, Jason. Oh, that is a uh, that is good. Um, thank you for having me. By the way, this is fantastic to be here. Uh, the the Sloan Analytics Conference is is lore uh, for an MBA grad like me. So it's a pleasure to be on the stage. Um, the most challenging decision uh, for me uh, over the last few months there have been several, uh, but probably the biggest uh, were some of the decisions that we um, that we made around people and entering the organization. We are, we're in a transformation of our business. We're all navigating COVID together, but for us, the fundamental transformation of our business was gonna be driven by a culture transformation. And there are a couple decisions that were made around people in this environment that I think were hard, but very important um, that Dan and Tanya, the owners of the club made and that I made as a leader. One was that um, we were gonna buck the trend of lots of organizations during this time. And we were gonna preserve our workforce through COVID. We decided we were gonna keep everybody, even if we weren't working at full capacity. And we decided to make that a major investment as a down payment, as proof that we meant it on culture change. And that, that money came straight out of the pockets of Dan and Tanya, you know, I, I ain't had that money. Um, but we did that and we put it forward and it meant something for our organization, the way we collaborated, the way we stuck to each other, the way that our individual behaviors helped us navigate COVID as the best team in the league on, on actual the medical performance in COVID. It all mattered because we chose to invest in people. And that's a hard thing that's hitting my bottom line, but it was an important thing. And, and similar to that, we had to very quickly shift and, and change our leadership structure um, to provide an organization that was supportive of all people of all types and all career paths. And you know, we, we've turned over you know, 90% of our uh, top two tiers of our organization. And it's not because everyone was bad, not because everyone was bad people, but because the unique culture, the skill set, the innovation that we wanted going forward, we had to build that very quickly. And so that's been very disruptive and hard but really, really important. And uh, so those are the two things I'd offer up. Yeah, listen, I think you're gonna hear some common themes, um, but it's interesting. I'll give you a slightly different uh, take on that because what Jason said really resonated and, and the human element was absolutely the hardest. Um, let me contextualize just, uh, you know, just to, uh, you're gonna hear a little bit of a tale of two cities from, from my vantage point today, because when the world shut down and I think we all remember exactly where we were when the NBA suspended their, their season. And then all of a sudden it was dominoes. But at the time I was um, still running Ticketmaster, the North American division of Ticketmaster. Um, and at some point, uh, you know, late, later on as, as we got to the other side of the crisis, I decided to make a career change. Um, but, but when I was a Ticketmaster and, you know, everything was happening so quickly, at, you know, at the time we had over 50,000 events that were on the platform. And so, you know, at first you're just, you're in crisis mode, right? And you're just trying to manage through that as quickly as possible. But on the question of what was most challenging, at some point, right, we realized that um, this was going, it was going to go on longer than anybody anticipated, right? I think early on, I remember when the last time I, I left the office, I was like, oh, we'll be back in a few weeks. And all of a sudden the reality of we're not coming back anytime soon started to hit. And so, 
we were forced with a slightly different decision, right? We're, you know, publicly traded company, um, massive burn rate. And so at some point we were forced to, to make those tough decisions, right? And decide based on the reality of what was happening, no events playing off, no on sales, um, you had by, you had the furlough, right? And, and um, we were very thoughtful about how we made those decisions, but I will tell you, um, you know, as we got to the other side of it, it was by far one of the most challenging things I've had to do professionally because there's a human element of, you know, nobody did anything wrong, but it was the right business decision to do. And, and I think the most important learning is just, you know, do it with empathy and integrity and that's the best you can do. So, but it was hard. And Rob, what about you? And then we'll get to Lindsay. Yeah, I'm going to spin it just a little bit differently because I think today we've heard a lot about the impact of the pandemic um, on our business. And uh, I don't think I'm alone here in saying that the most challenging decision was to choose optimism. Um, you know, there were plenty of reasons to, to feel the things we felt, fear and, um, you know, great concern and, uh, you know, mis being totally mystified by the enormity of the challenge, you know, 24-7, 365 sports network without sports. Um, and sure, I think you and I were actually on a conversation over the summer where I chose optimism as my answer. But I do think that our leadership chose optimism, which led us to um, make important decisions about how we were going to innovate, important decisions about where we were going to work, important decisions about how we're going to enable people to work from various places, to start partnering with, you know, league partners and imagining what the future could look like, um, you know, putting on a WNBA draft or an NFL draft where, you know, you're looking at Bill Belichick's dog, you know, um, you know Scott Van Pelt Sports Center devoting all of its energy to all these seniors who lost their last year of the ability to compete. Um, you know, and then choosing optimism and purpose in the face of incredible changes that were happening at the societal level uh, around and beyond sports. Um, and I think that that choice to be present and to try to work through uh, the incredible number of obstacles that kept showing up, um, you know, are things we're still gonna hold on to today because as others, others have said earlier today, it's not really clear where the end of this journey is. And so we have to retain that sense of optimism and purpose as we continue to navigate, you know, every little twist in the, in the journey at this point. Um, and then, you know, I'll also say that, you know, one of my responsibilities was to help oversee the ESPYs last year. Um, and just on a personal level, we lost a longtime producer, Maura Mant, in February, which led us to choosing to go forward with a show that we thought at the time was gonna be about heroism in the time of the pandemic, which then by late April, early May became a choice to change that show to be much more of the moment in terms of our national reckoning on race. Um, and if we had not chosen optimism in the belief that the impossible was possible, we wouldn't have gotten through that or so many of the other things we put on the air. Lindsay? Yeah, Robin, thanks. It was a great ESPYs. We represent yeah. Sue and Megan. We had a good experience. Oh, yeah. oh thank God. We got to talk after this, after this seminar. We got to talk. Yeah, we'll do that. We'll do that. We can go FaceTime after this. Um, I think that's a really nice place to jump off from. You know, I come from a little bit of a different perspective in terms of managing an organization, but really on the talent side. So it's, a, it's an interesting mix of folks talking about this from different points of view. Um, in terms of choosing optimism, we also had to choose a lot of vulnerability with our clients and make sure particularly, you know, as we move from addressing health and safety in the pandemic, figuring out what was next, are they going to have a season? You know, each one of our clients is a human being and they have their own very specific human concerns. And that is a big range. It's about them, it's about their family, it's about their sport. Certainly as we moved into more discussions about race, racial justice, there was a lot of trauma that we were dealing with. Um, and then we were able to embrace the opportunity to center the women that we represent as leaders in a movement. And that was a huge opportunity um, and also a, a big responsibility. So while we're managing that with clients and helping them address their own questions, their own education, 
helping them understand how to take a position on how to be a leader, um, who to, you know, saddle up next to, right? Because those are also really hard decisions in terms of who do we engage to educate them and help to lead them along the way. Um, you know, there were lots of hard decisions and that's then balanced with representing players who have long haul COVID system symptoms at this point and who are really struggling in a day-to-day -day battle to get back to normal training and having to really dive into the medical aspects of that. But I think for us, a, a big takeaway on it was that vulnerability piece and being able to bring the experts in, right? Like my job is not to always know everything, but it is certainly my job to go figure out who does. And so how to identify those people, how to integrate them into the conversation um, and, and not lead with your ego in that and make sure that we're helping people listen to the right folks, that, that became very, very critical. So I'm hearing that optimism and vulnerability helped you get through these challenges, helped you find a way through these challenges. I'd be remiss though, we're at an analytics conference. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask if, if data, qualitative or quantitative, played any role um, in helping you find a way forward through any of these challenges. And I see Jason nodding. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm assuming that's a yes. <laughs> yes, definitely. I think what, 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 um, what is often missed in, in discussing the use of data analytics, whether it's advanced techniques or basics, is that it can be applied to people issues as well. The soft stuff can have real quantitative analysis around it. And for us in our culture change, in order to hold ourselves accountable and actually measure that we're moving the needle, we set a quantitative baseline that measured our culture across uh, nine dimensions, 30 sub dimensions through a rigorous survey that we can benchmark against thousands of companies. We used a, a consulting firm to come in to help us with that. Um, uh, but it's going to allow us on a quarterly basis to see how our culture is actually moving. There's data visualization associated with that. We can break it down on the department by department level to see in an attribute of something like collaboration, have we moved the needle? Are employees feeling like we are more collaborative? What are the evidentiary points that we're now breaking silos and working across product lines? That sort of stuff can be measured and it's inherently culture and it's actually allowed us to progress more rapidly because not only are we measuring it and holding ourselves accountable, but you know, when you measure some people start to pay attention to it. <laughs> and so even though somebody might not actually be a, naturally a great cultural leader or inspiring person, they sure as hell gonna get on board if they're being measured by it. And so the power of analytics to drive behavioral change is, is very under leveraged on the culture side, in my opinion, and it's been a boon to us so far. Anyone else want to add something on that front? I'd love to quickly build on that. Um, I'd love to hear you say that. We're using it more and more now as we renegotiate deals for so many of the women that we represent who led through this dual pandemic to actually show, particularly to people who harbor a lot of bias against the value of women, that where the bar was set before is actually not the threshold we start negotiating at because their media value and their engagement value is actually so much richer and so much more robust and so much more powerful than perhaps people might guess based on the bias they bring to that conversation. So we've been leveraging a lot of analytics um, in discussions about renewals coming out of all this because our women have been really, really effective communicators and really, really effective leaders. And sometimes you gotta show the numbers. Sure, I think one of, one of the things that, um, from my vantage point, was most inspiring, um, and it happened very quickly, is how, how well I think the industry came together to share data, insights, and learnings, right? And, you know, I know we did, Jessica and the Kager group, and, and everybody across the leagues was, they were spinning up consumer research efforts, but there was a very, a very much an openness, right, to say, hey, here's what we're hearing from our user base, which may be a little bit different from your user base. So as we all think about and gear up for at some point, we, you know, the industry will come back. What are consumers saying? What's the data that we're, we're seeing? And, and I think that sense of um, collaboration and sharing of that data was, was really powerful. And, and I saw, you know, something magical happen in a way that you hadn't before, because there's always more historically, I think there's been more of a sense of competition and that data is power. 
Whereas, you know, here it was like, I'm happy to share our consumer insights with you because ultimately if we can come back on the other side of this even stronger, um, we'll all benefit from that. So I think that was really powerful. Yeah, and I would just contribute that well in advance of the, the pandemic, our, our audience insights team had been in, at really doing really important work around how ESPN was showing up for our fans and our audience. And um, there were a number of things that we held close to our hearts prior to the pandemic that became even more uh, necessary as we tried to figure out the things we would do while sports disappeared. And among those things were a call for uh, an awareness of um, how much we show up as fans ourselves, uh, the degree to which we are seen as author authoritative, the degree to which we are seen by our fans as bold. Um, and so you could see uh, that borne out in things like our really brilliant marketing campaigns that told fans that we miss sports too. Um, you know, or those sort of the dear sports let, uh, spots that we did with our talent to let people understand how we all felt about what was missing and what we longed for in terms of a return. Um, I would tell you that, you know, we saw a lot of really positive response to our moving the last dance up and into the world um, because it was uh, an attempt to acknowledge a need. And then the actual experience of watching the last dance each Sunday showed us this, this ability for ESPN to be a convening space for families and generations around storytelling that then turned into um, you know, a really positive and again, bold and surprising and engaging experience that went from week to week. Um, and a lot of that finding even supported our, our, our reporting and our work around social justice and the racial reckoning because we saw very clearly in the data that our audiences understood that this was a proper and necessary conversation within the coverage of sports, that it wasn't something that was pushing beyond some sort of imaginary boundary. And so that, uh, that emboldened us to be exactly where we are in terms of documenting what was happening you know, in each league, with each player, with each conference. Um, and that constant connection to the insights we were gaining around the audience you know, really actually heartened us all that we were close to our values as we were doing our work. Rob, I wanna stick with you. I mean, one of the things that the sports industry is known for is sort of ritual and routine and the pandemic was all about uncertainty. And you, you mentioned a little a moment ago that you, know, you were a sports network without sports. And so I wanted to know how you led through uncertainty, how you managed that uncertainty and what was key to that? Well, we have an extraordinary leadership team and we have, uh, to your point, we have a lot of history in um, thinking about things like you know, redundancy. You know, we have a we have a conditions note that goes out every morning. People might not think of it, but you know, rainouts and bad weather have impacted what we put on the air for years. So there are always these contingency plans for things that would show up across a host of networks. I would tell you that the programming team took that to a ridiculous extreme. <laughs> you know, I think that they 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 worked every angle. You know, we had Eagles concert at one point. We had a whole host of things that uh, you know really count as innovation in terms of content and finding new ways, you know, Korea baseball organization, whole new way of thinking about um, what programming can be. Uh, I do think that the other thing that we pride ourselves on is uh, really smart, efficient, high-end production that we told ourselves for years could only happen in the footprint of our Bristol headquarters. And yet our operations team, our technology team, you know, our security team imagine all sorts of ways to move that technology and that ability to create and that ability to appear on screen from all sorts of places. I mean, in the end, we ended up putting in a studio in the governor of Connecticut's home so that he could communicate to everyone. But, you know, you are still seeing live events that are broadcast in ways we never imagined could be broadcast. Um, and that is just due to the the understanding that the most important thing was meeting the needs of our audience and not necessarily adhering to the ways in which we'd always done things. And that goes back to what I'm ta I talked about earlier, just in terms of the things that we've learned along the way and the way in which they're gonna inform how we can continue to be 
where everybody needs us to be. And this wasn't just about ESPN one, this was also about Longhorn Network, it's about the SEC network. Like we take in the complexity of the difference between the way professional leagues were thinking about their futures and colleges were thinking about their futures and conferences were thinking about their futures and the way we thought about original programming and the way we thought about our studio programming. It really challenged us to move well beyond the relatively seamless path that the sports calendar promises us and in fact drove us to think about multiple contingencies and in fact you know to the it accrued to the benefit of many others i will tell you that you know the folks who work, work on films and documentaries proved once and for all that it's really important to have your own ip and your own storytelling that can appear irrespective of the sports calendar that's powerful and that helped us really think about the way in which we plan from a budgetary perspective and the way in which we sort of align our resources. So, you know, again, this was, this was a really about constant communication ar across a really creative leadership group um, and teams of incredibly resourceful people, uh, you know. And like I said, True North was our fans. True North was just meeting the needs of our fans. Mm -hmm. So I hear you talking about uh, communication and resourcefulness, but also innovation. So I, I want to put it to the rest of the panelists in terms of what, uh, if you could single out, or you know maybe there's one or two things, one or two innovations um, that came out of the pandemic um, that you could discuss. And then also, I'm curious if there were innovations that came out of the pandemic that you are now going to continue forward post-pandemic. So Amy, why don't we start with you and then we'll get to Jason and Lindsay. Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, I can't take credit for this one because I wasn't at FanDuel at the time, but I think it's a great example. Um, you know, listen, at the time when everything was shutting down, there were literally no real sporting events to bet on, right? But the, you know, the the insight was, all right, hang on, th throw revenue targets out the, out the door for a minute. Consumers they view this as a form of entertainment, right? There's a huge void in, um, in people's lives. And oh, by the way, people have more time on their hands. And so one of the things that the team did, I think phenomenally well, is they pivoted quickly and they said, okay, consumers want to engage. How do we give them other opportunities to do that? And so, um, you know, as, as my Ticketmaster team was managing thousands of canceled events, the Vandal team was drumming up new, they, great new free-to-play products, um, for the democratic debate, right? They, so they came up with these, you could bet on The Bachelor, um, they streamed this, I, I love this one um, because now it's a huge betting market for us, but the, they streamed Russian and Ukrainian table tennis. Um, and now it's, it's one of the most uh, engaging um, markets that we have right now. So just that, that innovation and the insight around people have time, they wanna be engaged. There's a void that you know, live entertainment broadly um, has it in, at this point in time, how do we, how do we just pivot quickly? And I think acknowledge that, you know, for every company or for many companies, all the objectives that they set the, in the beginning of the year in some ways were irrelevant, right? So it was about, okay, how do you re, you know, pivot the organization, get them focused on what matters. And, and for FanDuel, it was, it was really about driving engagement and, and providing great innovative experiences. And I think a lot, of, a lot of that will just continue, right? As we think about new and different ways to engage an audience. I know, Jason, you are, you are telling a story of innovation. Yeah, I mean, I'll build, I'll build on what Amy said, and, and this is something we've done you know, in partnership with FanDuel, the story I'll tell on this, but, um, but I think what, what the pandemic did is it accelerated the pace of the change that was already happening in our industry and in others. Um, and it obviously has a digital flavor because of the nature of remote work in the pandemic, all the digital innovation that was already happening in this fourth industrial revolution just sped up, just sped up. And, and one of those trends that is sort of foundational to the sports industry is the way that our fans, the, the way that a fan base is growing and the way that that growing fan base is engaging the game. And so one of the big uh, tentpole achievements for us this year was our partnership with FanDuel, which was the first operating partnership in legalized sports betting between an NFL team uh, and an operator um, here in Virginia. And that was foundational because we know that the future of our game relies on us reaching a set of fans that do not engage with the game in a traditional fashion. You know, you could throw labels on it, Gen Z or whatever, but I, I would more call it uh, the digital consumer, the digital fan. 
they are engaging in daily fantasy. They're engaging through legalized sports betting. And we have to actually develop a strategy for understanding, connecting with those fans, telling brand stories that resonate with them, creating guest experiences that um, may include in venue, but also might be a premium experience that never sets foot in the venue. That's totally di digitally driven. And our partnership with FanDuel was a start in that direction by uniting together to understand this fan base better, to give them a product they've been asking for here in Virginia. Um, and, and what that does is it positions us in the future. If we get to a future where this new generation of fans don't have a hometown team, but they have a favorite team, we want to be their favorite team in the midst of others, right? And, uh, and so we've been able to broker this innovative partnership along with other uh, related activations uh, uh, this year in venue and out of venue that we will stick with. We will stick with and we will ride for the long haul because we think they're the growth engine for our club and the industry writ large. Lindsay, in innovation on your end or perhaps with your athletes or through your athletes. You know, something we're working a lot on right now that's just become a little bit more every day in terms of the temperature tracking and general health and wellness check-ins and focus on that is how that connects with women specifically in and around their menstrual cycles, in and around fertility and family planning. It's really fascinating. And it's, it's an example of how you can really find opportunity in spaces where perhaps it felt like there was a void um, because there is. And we were working with a company called Orico in partnership with a few of our athletes um, to actually use the data that they've been gathering to help them understand performance through their cycle, how to protect against injury. Um, and it's really exciting to work on, especially as a former athlete myself, I also happen to be a woman. Um, and the insights available to help them be better, not just as athletes, but as human beings. You know, We've worked a lot with our athletes on freezing their eggs and in advocacy in and around the importance of family planning and egg freezing for them in their careers. So, you know, some of the innovations for us are also continue to be very personal, but also then play into larger sponsorship conversations because there's all these companies that may not have thought about sports as the place to activate. But when you think about women, it's actually the perfect place because women in the workforce, women thinking about family planning, women thinking about their cycle, women thinking about the products that address those things. It's a really unique audience and a way to, to reach people that we're seeing a lot of activity come from it. And a lot of that comes back to the innovation and tracking. I've got my ring on right now. And I'm just curious, you know, Jason talked about how the pandemic has sort of accelerated developments. And I'm wondering in, in what you were just talking about, do you feel that the pandemic has accelerated interest in those areas and studying those areas when it comes to female athletes? And if so, why? What was it about the pandemic that, that raised the consciousness of this being a, a place where sponsors could activate? I'm not sure if it was necessarily just the pandemic, but like so many other things is this convergence of all these different things at once, right? And we're at this intersection of all of these moments and that women athletes have really been able to capitalize on that because of their authentic connection in so many of those conversations. In that, and in, you know, we launched our business, The Collective, which is really dedicated to insights and, and serving women um, in the industry. And all of the data points to how much this matters, also with women as the principal folks who control spending in a household. And so all of us are stuck at home, right? Mom's got a lot of power, whoever the person is doing the household spending. And so I think the fact that women athletes have been doing so much of this work, have been authentically engaging for so long, it happened to then come at a time where it's funny, people started the pandemic saying, is this the death of women's sports? I mean, it actually became this huge celebration for the power of women, right? And the power of women as leaders. And so it's been a real opportunity for us, sure, where people maybe were noticing a trend, they were really able to go all in. So I'm curious um, if the pandemic has changed the way your organizations measure success. I mean, you, you know, you've talked about, you know, reaching the fan and fan engagement and uh, sort of what I'm hearing is a sort of a more holistic approach to looking at things. Um, so are you measuring success differently and do you, and or do you anticipate measuring success differently post pandemic? And again, Jason, you, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're a frequent nodder. So I yeah. see you nodding. This is bad. I keep calling attention to myself. I'm gonna stop. 
I was gonna say, yeah. I was gonna say you are, but it's a good it's a good thing for me. Yeah, no, no, I have definitely have a perspective on this. I usually have a perspective. Might be wrong, but I have one. Um, uh, on this one, I think uh, you actually sort of highlighted it in your question, especially in a year where you know we only had one game with more than three thousand fans this last year. Like, it was a bloodbath on our financial. It was not pretty. It was not pretty. And we still, we are carrying a bit of that weight into this year, right? It, it colors some of our decisions. So it was a challenging time for all of us. That said, um, we had to focus, we couldn't, we couldn't look at the, at gate revenue. We couldn't, couldn't look at some of the sweet sales. We couldn't, we couldn't look at some of the, the normal things that you would look at. So you have to actually anchor in on the leading indicators that are, um, that are, um, that are indicative of the strengthening of a fan base. You had to look at the top of the consumer funnel instead of the bottom because the conversions aren't happening to season tickets and single game sales. But the activations through social media and digital channels, we, we invested heavily in our social media team, thinking about our tone and our voice around reaching diverse communities, thinking about customer demographics, fan demographics that we weren't typically tapping traditionally through our marketing engines. How do we get credibility, laughs, connection with those communities at the top of the funnel to activate them and generate interest in our brand, in our team, in what we're doing. Highlight the success on the field. That helped. Coach Rivera hooked me up. That helped. We had to focus on all of those leading indicators um, at the top of the funnel. And now it's on us to rapidly build our BI and analytics function, which is a gap for us. Um, there are some teams that are great at this. The Miami Heat, I admire deeply on this. Uh, the guy they have there running at Edson Krebcor is a remarkable man. A remarkable man who has done amazing work there. Um, they, they, what they have built allows them to leverage that. We have to build that now. So it's allowed us to say, okay, if these leading indicators are what's going to funnel us, we need to understand how this pulls through. We need to understand what we're learning at a second and third level about our fans. So we've got to build this capability. We, have, we need to have a robust uh, and intricate CRM. We need to have self-serve capabilities across marketing, across ops, across sponsorship so that they can slice and dice that consumer data, that fan data in a way that drives product innovation, that colors outreach, that helps them structure deals and rate cards. Um, so it's made, it's put the onus on us to ramp up even more quickly than we already plan to because all we have to lean on right now are those leading indicators and we have to make them into something tangible because we can't wait till we get to the season and we say, well, let's see, let's see how ticket sales go. That's a recipe for, uh, for disaster. Yeah, sure. The other thing I, and we've talked a lot about um, uncertainty and how we all manage through periods of uncertainty. I, I think coming out of this, um, you know, I know one of the things that I think for most organizations is going to be important is how do you create more flexibility and agility in the way you run your organization, right? The, the ability to scale up and down quickly if you need to, the ability to pivot and use technology that maybe you hadn't used before, right, to spin up a remote workforce. Um, so I do think there's something that is a permanent lesson. We're going to have more uncertainty. Whether, what it looks like, we don't know. Um, but figuring, you know, I think that's going to be a really critical success metric. How we measure that, right, is, you know, may, may look a little bit different from company to company. But I think that's going to be really critical coming out of this. And I wouldn't say we're going to utterly abandon some traditional measures of success like ratings. You know, we're not gonna we're not gonna walk away from that forever. I mean, we have a great story to tell about the women's final four and the and the women's championship game. You know, the last dance had no issues because it had no competition, but it had no issues. So we like those stories. We recognize the challenges there. We we, you know, again, we have to operate with some measure of optimism about the way in which we see upcoming rights deals play out across various networks, and we gotta be smarter about what we think a network is. So to the real, the really smart point about the degree to which our active points are social spaces, you know, we have to continue to work to figure out the right way to make it clear that that level of engagement is part of our constant conversation around what success looks like. Um, you know, we're dealing with a very different audience that a year of being isolated from one another and having dread of the person six feet away and, you know, having a sense that the world is uh, really an on-demand space rather than a space where you have to make an appointment in order to share a common experience. We got to find ways to adjust. Um, and you know, when we do, we'll also apply to that work uh, standards of success. But I do think we're seeing important um, developments in the streaming space, whether it's time spent 
or you know whether it's aggregate audience in real time versus over time. Um, I do think that to the to the conversation around things you can do uh, beside adjacent to the game, whether that is wager or whether that is purchase or whether that is to com communicate with fellow co-viewers, all of that's going to turn into a real conversation about success metric. And those are things we're all leaning into really, really hard. Did you, did you want, did you want to chime in here? Okay, um, I think we have, we're almost to the point where we're gonna turn to audience uh, questions, but before we do, I'm just curious, um, and, I, and I think Amy, you alluded to this or actually talked a little bit about this in your last answer, but if your organizations were faced with another crisis, the scale of a pandemic, what would you do differently? <laughs> and there you go, Jason, shaking your head. <laughs> I, like how, I like how demonstrative you are. <laughs> Um, but, but what would you do differently? What, what are the sort of, you know, in combination with the lessons learned, what would you do differently? How would you handle it differently based on what you've gone through the last year? You want me to go first? Sure. Um, listen, I, I'll tell you the one thing I wouldn't do differently um, is lead with empathy, open and honest, you know, transparent communication and integrity, right? These were very difficult times. Nobody had the all the answers. Um, and I think just acknowledging that um, and recognizing that everybody was experiencing their own pain in different ways, uh, th that empathy goes a long way. Um, what I would do differently, uh, listen, I think we um, we all learn the, the importance of over communicating during these challenging times. I probably would have done even more of that, right? I mean, both the, the formal and the informal. And I, and I think you know, early on when you're just in crisis mode, you're 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 dealing at times with a, a smaller select group of people just to get through the decision making quickly. Um, but figuring out how you expand that quicker so that you're giving you know your troops more broadly the the direction they need, um, and then maintaining that right. I think these there's some great practices that we develop that well, you know you want to stick with after after the pandemic. So. Jason or Lindsay, if, if any of you want to add in, or we can we can go to uh, audience questions. Or Rob, if any, if you want to. Well, I mean, I think the one thing that I would do differently is not fall into the trap of Lucy pulling the football away from Charlie Brown and thinking that things are going to get better in a month or two months or three months, but really, you know, dive in as though this is existing state until things change. You know, and I think really. Um, uh, I would tell you that I think we did a really good job of making it, making mental health resources available to everyone who was going through all that there was to go through. But um, you know, one of the one of the, the takeaways is just that the false sense that there is a clear uh, light at the end of the tunnel actually really created a second wave of exhaustion. Right once we once the weather got cold again and people realized, wait, we're not done. I mean, that, I think that is something worth avoiding next time, but just making it clear to people that resources are available, they're there in perpetuity, that we are working through this and, and really help people get a clear sense of whether or not the end really is near. I think that's a really, really important one. Look where we are a year plus later, you know? So, um, and of course, hindsight's twenty twenty. Yeah. The, um, the only thing I could think of there, and that really builds on you, Rob, saying that and thinking about this as a long-term thing, we had a lot of Olympians who added a year to their training. And that was not something that we could have planned for. There was a lot of panic about finding places to train. How do we do it safely, right? There continues to be some of that. But even now that we have it dialed, making sure people rested, making sure clients just took the time to heal, versus making sure that they were maintaining this very hectic and very committed training schedule. I think we're seeing now heading into the Olympics that some of those athletes are needing to do that right before now in Olympics that, you know, they, this was supposed to be their rest year. And we just didn't know how long it was going to go on. So that's the 2020 hindsight for us specifically in working with clients is we probably should have forced rest a little bit earlier. I'm going to turn to some questions from the audience now, and I think actually, Lindsay, this one is is 
suited for you. And it says so many athletes have used their platform to speak out against racism and social injustice over the last year. How will we look back and quantify the impact of this? And anyone is welcome to jump in, but I know you have, you know, you're with the athletes, you're at athlete level. So you're on mute. I'm on mute, I'm back. Yeah, there will be, a, I'm curious to hear everybody on the panel's insights here. For us, this is the work that we've always done with clients. It happens to be a moment now where it was very well received and certainly well covered um, and amplified. It was very timely, but this is the work that, that WNBA and frankly women athletes and black women athletes have been doing for a very, very long time. Um, and so it was really a lot of my clients talk about, you know, the moment meeting them rather than them meeting the moment. And so I think what we're seeing with data, I mean, we, it's a very clear story in terms of young people want to connect with brands and athletes who stand for something. And those are the people who are really getting traction. We're finding that, the, that our athletes who have been very clear about who they are and been very clear about racial justice and been very clear about their uh, willingness to step up when it's hard and when it's noisy, I think they are benefiting from that. And I think we're seeing brands benefit from it too. But now we're going into a space where you put up the black box. Now I wanna show, show us the work, right? Show us what you've been doing. And that's the space that we're in now that I think people are going to hold brands and athletes accountable for. So we're working really hard to make sure we continue to deliver on that. Hey, I just wanna jump right in because, you know, we were joking earlier, Lindsay and I, about Sue Bird and Megan Rapino as co-hosts with Russell Wilson of the ESPYs. And, um, you know, I think about Maya Moore and what she did in stepping away from her career to do something incredibly powerful where criminal justice is concerned. I do think about Renee Montgomery, who's like now like a team owner. Um, and I, I think about the the outcropping of even Sue saying what she said at the ESPYs about being quiet prior and now being part of a collection of women who have like a media entity underway. Um, you know, all of those things are clear examples of work that's being done. You know, I think virtually every one of us who are in the media business are calling Spring Hill and asking LeBron's team what we can work on together. And, you know, these are, these are material moments in which really smart and very young, by the way, very young people uh, are going to help us quantify the impact. Um, and you could miss it. You know, I, I remember being on a SBJ panel, oh man, this must be like eight years ago where John Orand asked the question, you know, in, in, four, in five years, what's gonna be the most interesting storyline in media? And I said, what LeBron James does. And at the time I didn't think I was, you know, I mean, I was taking a guess. But it's kind of true. Like we're, we're at a point now where it's not just a matter of being in the media. It's the storytelling that happens through it. We're fortunate enough right now to be working with Colin Kaepernick and a host of projects. I will tell you that 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 is a lot more than just, you know, a story you might predict. There's thinking and there's vision and there are activations that are designed to do exactly what you're asking, Shira, which is to have real and lasting impact. Um, and I, I find it to be one of the, along with uh, two Olympics within a year's time and a World Cup immediately after, one of the sleeping giants in the stories we have to document as storytellers, um, because there is, it is, it is, it's not a moment, it's a movement. Yeah. Rob, that was a good promo for Maya's documentary, thanks. <laughs> uh, Which is great, by the way. Which is really, really good. <laughs> Her story is so inspiring. I, I don't know how we'll quantify it um, yet. Um, I, I think there are some measurable examples, but I think the moment can be categorized as the moment where athletes already so much better than when I played as a player had become sophisticated at using their voice to drive dialogue in society around a variety of topics. This was a pivot from um, effective dialogue that catalyzed change through other parties, whether it was companies, you know, the sponsors of teams, stuff like that, who catalyzed the change, to being the drivers and catalysts of change themselves um, at, a, at, a societal, at a societal and systemic level, right? And the WNBA and the women of the WNBA are the best example of this. 
where there were real systemic changes, whether it was in policies, laws, et cetera, that came from their direct work within and around communities. And, and our guys modeled that, um, and our team modeled that on the business side as well. Um, in, in the wake of the shooting in Wisconsin, when uh, everything sort of paused for a moment in the sports world to reflect, coming out of that, our guys said, well, we wanna do two things. They told Coach Rivera this, we wanna do two things. We wanna be able to take some sort of um, um, approach where we help uh, civic engagement, where we get people civically engaged, for the long run, but particularly around this election cycle. And then we want to get involved in a substantive way with changing laws around criminal justice. And what we ended up doing with our DM votes program was not just providing our stadium, but also providing a holistic set of levers that allowed the DC, Maryland, Virginia community to have a better chance actually getting out to vote. We provided transportation to our venue and to other polling places. We worked with Jose Andres and World Central Kitchen to provide food for people in line, which, you know, some states have now outlawed a uh, hot mess, but um, uh, <laughs> providing, you know, providing <laughs> waters for folks, you know, like, come on, you can't give somebody a water, you're gonna get arrested, come on. Um, uh, but providing a holistic set of levers and even working on registration, we had this beautiful moment where um, we were working registration on a bi-weekly ba or semi-weekly basis to get people registered to vote in the area. Um, and the last day of registration for Virginia, the voter registration system went down, but we had all the paperwork and we got several hundred people registered on the day where the voter registration went down because we had made that investment uh, to get people registered. So we, uh, this really beautiful thing around voting. And then our guys um, uh, at the end of it, um, led by Chase Young, were working with the legislature in Virginia um, on uh, police reform on criminal justice reform. And they were instrumental in getting a bill passed in Virginia uh, that, that is now law. And then they went on and did it in Maryland. And Chase Young testified uh, at the hearing where the bill was passed about his parents' experience as law enforcement officers and his experience in society. And we actually jumped in with legislators to help shape that in conjunction with law enforcement. They, they worked collaboratively with law enforcement and legislators to get this done. So they got their hands dirty and in the mix, using their platform and their influence in a new way that I saw as an evolution. Role modeled first by the women of the WNBA, but it is now caught on. And I think will be the new model for some time. And it's our job as executives on the business side, those that care, is to put structure resources around it to amplify that platform and use our connections. You know, it was my community relations team that got the connections with legislatures and politicians and all of that to use our connections to supercharge the desire and the passion that exists in our athletes. I think that leads nicely into the final question I have as we're running short on time, which is you, you've sort of described what the next normal will look like in some sense for your organization and for the sports industry. So I'm curious, Amy, Lindsay, Rob, what do you think, you know, very quickly, I know it's not a, an easy question to answer quickly, but what will the next normal look like in some respect for your organizations and or the larger sports industry? Who wants to take that first? Go ahead, Amy. I'm happy, yeah, I'd say, I'd say two things. I'm kind of looking at this from a business perspective. One is the industry is gonna be 100% digital, right? The years of should we be mobile entry or not, it's over. Um, this is gonna be the catalyst, right? To drive in that direction. And I think that's gonna unlock great opportunities around safety, security, personalization, taking friction out. And then the second thing is the, the second screen experience, right, that we're all talking about. That convergence is happening faster than we expected, and it pre presents great opportunities. So I think watching how that and, and having a, a role in shaping that um, in a way that really elevates um, and changes the experience um, for the better is going to be really exciting. So I think those two trends are going to be pretty prominent going forward. And then Lindsay and Rob, and I'll just yeah. start stop at 250. No, I think those two things are right on, Amy. And I think for us, the focus is on how women participate and lead in that. Uh, that second screen experience, Robbie mentioned about the success of Spring Hill, certainly launching together. We've got three of the four founders um, of that business. And there's a lot of interest. And this goes back to share the question about how you measure success. I think brands and media and money being spent 
with women athletes doing storytelling on their stories and, and stories that they feel like are important. That's something that, that we're gonna see. I think the investment around women and the benefit that comes from that is a big part of what's next. And if you rely on the analytics, it tells you it's a smart bet. Terrific, and Rob. Very quickly, I just think uh, on-demand viewing and remote co-viewing, um, those kinds of complementary experiences are gonna be the way that our industry is gonna have to adjust to catch the most audience. And with that, thank you, everyone. Thank you everyone, for coming to the conference this year virtually. Thank you, Amy, Jason, Lindsay, and Rob. It was a pleasure to see you and hear from you. Thanks. Yeah.